Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Irvin. I work for Giotto Paper. And in a moment, I'm going to be handing you over to uh, Jimmy Lim, who is the, uh, one of the experts at Sawgrass Technologies. And he's going to be speaking to you about uh, breaking the rules of sublimation. Um, at the end of the session, there's going to be a question and answers. Um, so if you've got any questions, write them down uh, during this webinar. And uh, we will go through any questions you may have at the end of it. Um, so over to you, Jimmy. Well, thank you, David. It's good to be here as always. I look forward to another um, interesting session here. That hopefully we can relay some information out there that's beneficial to um, our attendees. Now, as you can see, the title is Breaking the Rules of Sublimation, which you know, I like that title because I'm a bit of a rebel. And I like the concept of breaking rules, even though I have learned through experience that breaking the rules can get you into trouble. So we're going to try and address this in regards to sublimation such that maybe we don't get into trouble. So definitely, if you're starting out as a new sublimator, uh, you know, you have a lot of concerns. You know, you're not sure what happens when I use this setting or what about this substrate or what about this color or will it work on this? I mean, there's a lot of good questions. And, you know, we, we try to, to answer a lot of those questions by doing a very simple thing, putting you within a group of boundaries. And within those boundaries, we tend to define what it is you can do and what it is you can't do and what to avoid and what to embrace and use these settings and that type of thing. So we put you in a nice, safe little box, okay? And you stay in the box and you're pretty safe and that's cool. But, um, you know, the box is not really so much defined by rules, as we like to say, as by guidelines. Now, that's an important difference because, you know, most rules in this industry are pretty solid, okay? Yeah, you know, so we we have figured out some things that won't work, okay? If you try to sublimate it 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it won't work, okay? So there's some rules there. But the reality is a lot of things that you've been told, a lot of things you hear, or maybe you've read, they're guidelines, and they're good guidelines for the most part. But, you know, I'm an innovator, and the concept of moving beyond the rules, or should I, should I say breaking the rules, has some appeal to me because I don't like to be told you can't do that. Now, it's not that I have this issue about challenging authority. It's the issue of just because you said I can't do it doesn't mean it can't be done. See, that's kind of how I think. So over my years of doing decorated products, you know, I have challenged many rules. And guess what? Sometimes I was successful and sometimes I was not. So the reality is that you may find some of the guidelines truly are rules, and you really can't bend them, whereas other ones, maybe you can twist them just a little bit. And that's what we're going to kind of look at today, because um, typically if you've gotten into sublimation, you were given a list of rules somewhere along the way, and you're probably going to follow those rules. And I'm going to list for you what are so-called most basic rules that we have for sublimation. And then we're going to look at each one and kind of say, is that really a rule? Is there a way to round it, or you know, is it just not defined very well so that you can maybe push your boundaries a little bit. So those basic rules of sublimation that we're going to challenge today look like this. It only works on white. You know, I was told that so many times when I first got involved in sublimation. It only works on white. Got tired of hearing it, but that's what they said. It only works with polymer fibers. It requires exact production settings. People just say, you know, do not deviate from this setting. You, you have to use this exact setting or it's not going to work. Uh, it can't be used on outdoor products. Okay, so you can only do indoor things. Stay away from anything that's outdoors. Uh, you can only sublimate on flat surfaces. I mean, you know, look at the heat press, right? Um, and then finally, it only works on manufactured products so that you have a really finite solution there of uh, substrates. So let's look at these and let's figure out, are these really rules or are they just guidelines? Okay, where can we play with this a little bit? First one becomes it only works on white. And, you know, I've been, like I said, told that so many times, and you probably have to. The reality is that's not a rule. It's a guideline. White happens to be the best color. It's not the only color, as it turns out, but it is the best color, and not just for sublimation. White is the best color for any form of printing, even screen printing. Now, let's think just for a minute. What is sublimation? Sublimation is a dye process. So we're using a dye that's basically translucent or transparent by its nature. It's very thin, um, and it's also going into the fibers instead of onto the fibers. So there's a big difference there. When we dye something, we're recoloring the fibers, in this case of a shirt, um, like from the inside out because of the way that 
um, sublimation bonds internally with the molecular fibers of polymers and polyesters. But on the other hand, if you're doing printing like screen printing, you're bonding ink to the outside. Now, if you look at traditional printing like screen printing, direct to garment printing, digital transfers, all those particular inks are for the most part pigment based and they have some type of binding agent in there, some type of adhesive. Okay, but we call them binders. Um, and typically those are activated by heat because if you think about it with screen printing, we have to cure the screen printing with heat and we're also, you know, amongst other things, we are activating those binders so that the screen print actually stays on the shirt. If you use direct to garment printer, same thing, you're putting ink down, it has binders and we put it under a heat press or a dryer so that it makes those binders activate and bind to the shirt. Uh, digital transfers, digital transfer, the binder is either in the paper or it's in the ink, but either way, we have to apply it. Sublimation has no binders whatsoever. Sublimation, it's a molecular process. When the sublimation turns into a gas, um, it will uh, penetrate into the polymer and bond to that at a molecular level. No binders, no adhesives there. Okay, so but that's an important distinction because of the way it's going in um, and the way it's recoloring the fiber. The color of the fiber itself, or the color of the polymer, has an effect on the color of the ink. So when we say white's the best color. When we go in and we, we dye sublimate white, um, we are going to get the best color clarity we can possibly get. Okay, If we go and put it onto any other color, it could affect the colors of the image. By the way, same problem with direct to garment printing and same problem with most digital transfers because they're very thin digital based inks. So you want to keep that in mind. Now, um, as I mentioned, sublimation is a dye, so the color of the background can have an influence on the dye. Okay, White's definitely the best color. Light colors can be sublimated, and typically the only time we ever see color is with apparel. Uh, most of our substrates are white. There's a few that aren't, but most are white. But when we look at apparel, can we do light colors? Yeah, absolutely we can do that. Um, anybody that told you you can't do anything but white it misled you. You can do these colors. However, uh, there are some limitations when we do colors with sublimation because we find, first of all, that depending on the nature of the color, some colors do sublimate better than others. Uh, for example, um, gray heather can be challenging a lot of times, especially with photos, okay? And you would think it's not because it's fairly light that way. Um, the dye itself must always be darker than the surface. So if you start working towards dark colored garments or dark colored surfaces in general, then dye sublimation is probably not going to work for you. Yes, you can sublimate darks, you just can't see it, okay? A little problem there, right? Uh, but you can certainly do darker shades of color, for example, like red. You can put black on it. But uh, your dye sub colors must always be significantly darker than what the background is. So you start to limit yourself to how many colors you can use when you go to colored backgrounds. And then there's the other aspect um, of not having white ink, which we'll hit in just a minute. Now, it should be noted that some of our hard substrates, mostly um, photo panels in the aluminum family, uh, come with uh, more of an aluminum or silver type of finish than a white finish. And that gives you a really nice special effect. You can utilize that the right way. Uh, we have other uh, substrates that have a bronze um, finish too, but 99% of them do have a white finish, so we don't have that problem. Now, moving on to the dark colors though. See, everything we talked about there was light. If you go into darks, and if you look at how screen printers do this, how direct garment people do this, uh, they don't actually print directly on white with colored logos. I mean, excuse me, they do not print on directly onto here, let me start again. They don't print directly onto darks with their logos. Okay, they um, actually have a little trick that they use, and unfortunately, we can't use a trick for sublimation. I'm going to show it to you anyway. What they'll do is they'll actually put down a layer of white first, so they create a white surface of which to put their colors on. And with screen printing, they're using a special engineered ink called white ink that's applied and then it's using heat to cure it and then they go and put all the colored inks on top of it. So the reality is they're still printing on white. They just created an artificial white surface on top of the dark surface so they'd have a white surface. And you see the same kind of thing with um, many of the direct garment printers as well. Um, so that is you know how they get around it. Now, the way that they put white ink down is they're putting an artificial surface on top of that particular garment and then applying their inks on top of it. With sublimation, we need to be able to penetrate into the fibers of the garment, so therefore the concept of white ink really isn't going to work out for us. The second aspect is that with color, uh, color uh, of sublimation, our printers are CMYK printers, and 
that's a four color printer, cyan, yellow, magenta, and black. And we combine colors of, of cyan, yellow, and magenta to be able to create the colors that we need. So we're mixing them together kind of like paint. And there is no color combination of cyan, yellow, and magenta that will yield the color white. So we don't have an ability with our printer to actually create the color white. White has to be engineered and then interjected in separately. So that's another aspect of why we're not doing this with CMYK printers. Okay, so there's another aspect of that white ink too. First of all, we put that white ink base down and then we're able to put colored ink on top of it and we get the color clarity we're looking for. The second aspect is we do have images that need to color white as part of the image. Now, your computer, when you're working in your graphics program, um, with a few exceptions, but for the most part, your computer uh, will leave the areas that are supposed to be white open. And certainly if it's sending to a printer, it knows that there's no combination of, of inks at the printer that are going to generate the color white. So if we're working with an image like the eagle there that has white in the head and we're putting it onto a white t-shirt, we will have no problems. And you can't even feel that. You might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, there's no ink there. Can I rub my hand over the surface and feel that the white's missing? Not with sublimation, because sublimation is in the surface instead of on the surface. With a process like um, DTG, maybe, uh, screen printing, certainly, because screen printing is built up on the surface. Uh, but reality, that's how we do this. Okay, When we create things on a white background, we leave the white areas open in the graphic, and we're fine. But if we put that graphic on a blue background, as you can see here, two things happen. Number one, all those white areas that were left open are now the same color as the background, blue. The second thing is you can see that the image itself is a little bit duller because that darker background has affected the ink colors. So we may actually have to make a few adjustments to, to put some um, color um, clarity back into that image, you know, to brighten it up just a little bit. Okay, so you know that is one of um, the challenges of sublimation is working with anything other than white. Yes, we can. But there are some challenges along the way. And that's why some people tell you it only works on white. No, not true. It works beyond white. But in certain situations, uh, it becomes a limiting factor when we're working on a color besides white. Okay? Now, that's usually only for apparel. Because when we're doing non-apparel substrates, 90%, 99% really, of all of our substrate blanks are white to begin with. They're manufactured white. And typically what we're doing is full coverage or full bleed images, which means we go from edge to edge. So we cover the entire surface, something we can't do with apparel. Okay, So with apparel, because you know the shirts are bigger than our printers and our heat presses, we can't cover the entire surface, so we're just putting a logo on there. But with our, our non-apparel substrates, we typically cover them all. Now this could be a lot of different things. This could be a mouse pad. This could be a photo panel. This could be a plaque. It really doesn't matter. It could be a sign. But what you're seeing here is a rectangle that's white. This is some substrate that I'm getting ready to sublimate. So and when I purchase it, it's white. And in this case, I need it to be black. So when I go buy a black substrate and then add um, sublimation to it, or would I buy a white one and recolor the whole thing? Option two. Of course, I'd buy a white one and recolor it completely. So what I'm doing is you can see I have a black background. That's part of my image. I did not start with anything that was black to begin with. So for most of our sublimation, not having white ink is never a problem, but most of our sublimation is done on a white background. So the main thing for you to understand is you can certainly experiment way beyond the color white. Just be aware that you may get color variations in your image when you go to different colored surfaces. That's the whole point here. Um, talking again about apparel, there is a process for wide format printing where you're using one of the bigger printers that starts at about 44 inches wide and an accompanying heat press that's quite large as well. With all of our sublimation, we can take a white garment and recolor the garment just like we're doing the non-apparel items because we're able to create a transfer that's large enough to uncover the entire surface of the garment. And in the case of t-shirts, we can do a finished t-shirt. We can make one um, transfer for the front and one for the back. Do it on a finished product. These particular two shirts on the screen, uh, those had to be done in a cut and sew process because they have things like collars. And because of that, we wouldn't be able to do a transfer for the front and for the back because we have a physical obstruction. So these were really kind of done more as panels. Like this shirt was done before the collar was sewed on. But you can see by holding up the bottom that this is white to begin with, and the entire shirt was recolored. And that's how we got white in the sublimation because those areas were just left open. So it's a background of the shirt coming through. 
bigger printers, bigger heat presses. That's what it takes to get that job done. Plenty of people that you can contract it out to. You may not want to make that investment. Okay, the next uh, one of our rules on the list is it only works on polymer fibers. You know, I get asked a lot of times, can you supplement on cotton? And, and no, you can't. I mean, there actually is a trick, but you really can't supplement on cotton. So we'll try and address that as we go. Okay, this is about chemistry. And this is a rule that I can't change. So we're going to find a way around it just a little bit, okay? Uh, the reality is that sublimation only bonds with polymers and polyesters, as simple as that. And really in the world of printing, this is important to understand because there is no one ink that works on everything that everybody is looking for. You know, inks are manufactured to work with specific surfaces. So you use different inks and different processes for different surfaces. It's just like a paint store. You go into a paint store, you do not have one paint that works on every surface. Just like glue. Think about that. What glue works on every surface? Super glue? No, it only works on fingers. But the reality is if you're going to paint wood, you buy wood paint. If you're going to paint metal, you buy metal paint. If you get those two mixed up, it'll paint, but it won't stay on there but so long because there's a mismatch in the chemical properties. It's the same thing here. Um, sublimation dyes bond with polymers and polyesters. They do not bond with cotton, wood, metal glass, um, paper, you know, there's a whole lot of things that they just do not bond with on a permanent basis. Okay, so that's uh, important to understand, using the right thing for the right surface. Now the chemistry of sublimation, remember sublimation turns into a gas when we heat it up, and that gas then is able to bond with polymers and polymer uh, polyester fibers. So um, if you're going to ask a question, can you sublimate cotton, don't, because you can't sublimate cotton directly. It will not bond, okay? Very important aspect. Now, we do have products out there that are wood, metal, glass, acrylic, stone, uh, lots of different types of products, but they've all had a, not a polymer coating applied to it or else there are actually some things like flip-flops, maybe a natural polymer to begin with. Uh, natural polymer is an oxymoron because polymers are man-made. But anyway, uh, so moving on beyond that, uh, we do certainly have substrates that have had a coating added to it, but if it doesn't have a coating, it's not going to work. So if you're thinking you need coffee mugs, don't go down to Target and buy a coffee mug and expect it to work. Okay, It's not going to. It doesn't have a polymer coating. All right, so that's an important aspect that we are buying substrates with the polymer surface because that's the only thing it's going to bond to. But if we move past some of the hard items, or should I say non-apparel items, and go back to apparel for just a minute, uh, you're going to see that with apparel, we can actually do things besides 100% polyester. Now, it only bonds to polyester, but what about 50-50? Yes, we can sublimate 50-50. We will not get the same image color clarity. Now, there's two t-shirts here. The one on the top was 100% polyester. The one on the bottom is 50-50 polycotton. You can see in that image that they're not exactly the same. I'm going to give you a little close-up now of the uh, bottom one, and you'll see even better what happened. It's faded. Okay? It has a faded look. So when we decrease the percentage of polyester in a blend, we're also going to decrease the brightness and the um, brilliance or vibrance of the colors of the image. That's important to understand. So you're going to get basically a washed out look. It's actually a little bit more washed out than you see it on the screen. But you know, I created that specifically for that effect. It makes a really nice special effect. So uh, when I set that up, uh, the item, you know, the concept was to give a special effect to the printing, and it matched the intended market and the intended customer. Here you can see that same image has been sublimated onto light 50-50 shirts. So I went past that white rule, and I went past the polyester rule, and uh, here I have the 50-50 tees that are in color. Yes, it has a wash look, but it's what I'm looking for in this situation. It works perfect. Does not work good for every situation, uh, and you can use various blends. It doesn't have to be 50/50. Uh, ideally, it's always more poly than it is of anything else, uh, because it's only going to bond to the poly. It will not bond to the cotton in a 50/50 shirt. That's an important distinction as well. Now, talking about shirts for just a minute, just a couple of things to be aware of because apparel sublimation is really getting hot now. I mean, there, we have more and more manufacturers that are providing shirts for sublimation, and the uh, 
consumer demand for uh, poly performance products is soaring and therefore we're seeing the uh, demand for sublimated apparel growing. Uh, but when you go to look at apparel for sublimation, just be careful of a couple of things. Uh, the manufacturing process may have an impact on the sublimation because some of these companies that are making shirts for sublimation, they did not make them for sublimation. They just happen to be a poly performance garment and because they read, just like you did somewhere, that sublimation goes hand in hand with polyester, they are now marketing their product as being an ideal solution for apparel sublimation. The reality is we found with some uh, different brands that um, things like antimicrobial coatings sometimes interfere with the sublimation. So you may have to do some experimentation is what I'm getting to. Uh, you may find more and more products there, but you still may have to go experiment with them a little bit to make sure that they're going to do what you want. Um, other problems with apparel sublimation is there's a lot of challenges especially in regards to the settings. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And what about nylon? You can ask about that one a lot. You know, nylon looks and feels a lot like polyester, but they, they do have some differences. The most notable one is melting point. Nylon typically melts at a lower temperature than sublimation. So if we lower our temperature down for nylon, then we're never going to get the image uh, color clarity that we're looking for because we don't have the right settings for sublimation. So nylon is challenging. Um, if you want to experiment with it, Feel free to do so. I'm not holding you back. Uh, the general consensus is that nylon doesn't really sublimate well, but I know some people who've experimented with and claim that they do an okay job, not a great job, with nylon. My question is, why do you need to do nylon? Uh, a lot, a lot of times, people will answer flags. They're looking to do flags. There are polyester flags available. So if you do a little bit of searching, you'll find that. And that becomes the first thing the question is, why do you need to do nylon? See if there is something suitable in the polyester world, because that's growing a lot. Specifically with polyester apparel, just some of the issues to keep in mind. Uh, fibers may not be 100% polyester. We found some people saying that that's a polyester shirt but it's actually like 90% polyester, so you're not quite getting the color clarity you're looking for. Uh, fabrics can have a big effect on the image. Very, very lightweight fabrics may allow the um, image to bleed through. Uh, very loose knits means that we have a lot of air gaps between the fibers. They can affect the quality of the image. Uh, different brands are going to have different settings. I'm, I find that apparel sublimation is the trickiest because we have to vary a lot of things between the brands. And, of course, the finishes and coatings could interfere with sublimation as well. Now, one of the things, this is where you got to be careful of sometimes. Um, people do go out and experiment. And, and I thought this was a great concept of what somebody tried, okay, and it, and it didn't really work. Um, the only mistake they made was they told people it worked before they fully tested it. And what they did was they went and got some transfer paper for, um, not for sublimation, but for doing, um, digital transfers designed specifically for pigment inks. Remember I told you a few minutes ago that, that yeah, the pigment inks have some type of binder agent, which is an adhesive of a source, to force that ink to bind with the surface that there's being applied to. And in case of transfers, um, and these are transfers that are for cotton and they'll work on some blends and too. This is not sublimation transfer paper. But in the case of transfer paper for pigment inks for digital transfers, typically the binding agent's in the paper. So somebody got the idea, they said, hey, what if I sublimate, what if I uh, uh, use pigment transfer paper instead of sublimation transfer paper with sublimation dye, would it work on cotton? This is where they were going. So they, they loaded their printer with this type of paper, and uh, they printed onto it with sublimation dye, and they went and used a heat press, and they put on a cotton shirt, and they came back and said, hey, wow, it looked great, you know? And they were impressed, and they were on the Internet telling everybody about it, and then somebody told them to go wash it. <laughs> well, they went and washed it, and when they came back, they said, uh-oh, didn't really work. So, you know what, that's a great example of trying to, to, to break the rules a little bit. And, you know, I give them credit for trying. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out, but they tried, okay? <laughs> so, you know, nothing wrong with that. The mistake is when you go tell people it worked and you didn't fully test it. So especially with apparel, anytime you do anything different with apparel, Make sure you wash it multiple times and see what happens, okay? All right, next thing, it requires exact production settings, and you'll see that written in a lot of places, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 
uh, for 60 seconds with a, a medium pressure or 40 psi as the official. And most people have no idea what that is because they don't have a pressure gauge. Um, so we use the term medium pressure, which is very well defined. We all know what that is, right? Well, we don't. Okay. Um, most things that we work with, uh, pressure is not too crazy. I mean, as long as you got a decent amount of pressure, you're fine because pressure is required for sublimation. We do need that pressure on there, but it's not like you have to, you know, worry yourself as to whether it's 40 psi or not. Um, a medium amount of pressure to close and open your heat press is good. You do have to adjust the pressure depending on the thickness of the substrate, obviously. Um, but uh, these are those standardized settings. Now, the problem is, I was told that you know, to the letter of the law, you got to maintain that, and if you let it drift or anything, that you know, you may screw up your uh, sublimation. The reality is you can vary it some, okay? Um, if you vary it too much, it, it could be a problem. But when it comes down to the different substrates, sometimes we do make some variations. Now, temperature, doesn't we don't vary very much. It's more the time and the pressure that we vary uh, than anything else. For ceramics, for example, ceramics are giant heat sinks. They absorb heat. It takes longer uh, dwell times with ceramics than it does with some of the other things. So the key is, for example, if you order some mugs, those mugs should have, if they're designed for sublimation, they should have instructions as to what the ideal um, time temperature uh, settings are. As well with a mug press, and different mug presses, there are different qualities of mug presses. Some mug presses will cook a mug pretty quick, and other ones are a little bit slow. So it's a pretty wide range of about two to five minutes for mug press um, applications, depending on the mug press itself, as well as the mug can have some effect as well, too. So the main thing is read. Read and see what the recommendations are. Follow those recommendations. So if it tells you you need to deviate some, and this is coming from the people that manufacture it, they should know. They should have done the testing. So don't get too nervous about that. Where you see the biggest deviations, though, would be with apparel. And apparel is really, to me, the trickiest thing of all to sublimate uh, because there's just so many variances between the different garments. And they were never really manufactured specifically for sublimation, with the exception of a few, like vapor, for example, that uh, were manufactured specifically to be sublimated. One of the common things that you see on sublimated apparel is what we call a transfer line, which you can see in this picture. And that's that little razor-sharp line right below the words Newport Beach. Uh, if, you, I, if I zoomed out on this photograph, you'd see it actually all the way around. Uh, because in this case, what you're, you're getting is you're getting this little razor edge line where the edges of the transfer paper were. And it's really the result of too much time, temperature, and pressure. Really, all three. It's too much being applied there, and that's what happened. So we're going to have to change those settings away from what the ideal is. Most people, the first time they do apparel, they go lay the shirt on the platen, and they set 400 degrees for one minute with a lot of pressure. And what they end up with is the transfer lines. So there's several steps to actually getting rid of the transfer lines, and, and we're not going to cover that all here today. Uh, we'll look at doing another webinar specifically on apparel sublimation where we give you really good detailed information on that. But in the meantime, just to give you a real quick general, um, what we're trying to do is lighten the pressure being applied to the shirt. And one of the things that we're using is a foam pad, and that being the shirt will be on top of that foam pad, it's lessening some of the pressure that's being applied to the shirt because the foam pad is absorbing some of the pressure from the, um, the heat press. But we also use that same piece of foam pad. This is a cool thing to set the heat press up the right way because really the, the biggest challenge for getting our apparel heat press pressure set right is knowing what's, what's the right amount because it has to be super light. Very, very light. So light, if you look in this picture here, so light, the top platen, which is the silver, is not touching the bottom platen, which is the orange there at all. There's a big gap in between there. And the way that we set the gap was we took that same piece of foam, and I put the foam in, and I closed down the heat press, and I set it such that when it's fully closed, it does not compress the foam by more than half of its original height. Now, if you're sitting here looking at it and thinking about that, it could make you nervous. It's like, wait a minute, that's not enough pressure to work. You know, that's not, we're near medium pressure, correct. When we actually do apparel, we're not using medium pressure. We're using extremely light pressure. Okay, so we did go and deviate significantly on our pressure already. So that makes people nervous because it's so light. You know, the other thing that we do is we also change the other settings. We're going to change our time to 35 to 40 seconds. That's significant because 60 seconds is normal. Uh, 385 degrees, maybe 390. The idea is to get that as high as we can. But uh, 385 is usually a starting point. This can vary between the different brands. But the reality is that's a significant change from what you've probably been preached to what's been hammered into your head. So we made a lot of these changes 
and we still make it work, that we're bordering on being really out of bounds for sublimation. So I want you to keep that in mind. So there's nothing wrong experimenting, but realize as you start to decrease your, these settings, you typically start to see your image color vibrancy decrease um, as well. So if you feel like you know, you're not getting quite what you want out of something, don't be afraid to make some minor adjustments. Uh, time, you can increase it, decrease it, not a lot, but a little bit. Temperature, we rarely go above 400. Almost always we go down a little bit if we're going to go down. Don't go down much. Okay, ideally you keep it between 390 and 400 on pretty much everything that you do. There may be a few exceptions like you saw with 385, but typically 390 to 400. <clears throat> and same thing with pressure. Um, pressure is important, but it's not critical that you have that certain number in there. Okay, so we can play with that a little bit this way and the other. Now, if you want to experiment, always experiment with only one variable at a time. Don't go change all three. You know, change, uh, for example, you want to see what sublimation does on a, on a certain substrate or a garment. Um, Go with 60 seconds, then go with 50 seconds, then go with 40 seconds, then go with 30 seconds. You know, do several different um, pressings where you're only changing that setting, nothing else, just that setting, and then make a note of what's happening. So you can, you can start to see what happens when I decrease my time, for example. You can do the same thing with, you know, your temperature and your pressures. And that way you learn sublimation a little bit more as well. Just document it all. So, yes, we can deviate from those settings, but not real crazy. Okay, not real crazy. All right, you've probably been told it cannot be used on outdoor products. See, that's too general because, yes, sublimation is not UV resistant. It doesn't mean you can't use it on outdoor products. Uh, it's just not UV resistant. Another physical fact of the chemistry, we cannot change that fact. But that doesn't mean we can't go out and market products that get used outdoors. I mean, what the heck? What doesn't fade in sunlight? Uh, the only time I ever got an answer to that was an engraver who said engraving. So, you know, whatever. He was right. But what doesn't fade in sunlight, really? Um, everything that's paint, ink, or dye will fade over time when subjected to direct sunlight. Uh, how much it fades and how quick it fades depends on the intensity of the situation. So at the end of the day, if you know it's going to fade and you have an opportunity for something that's outdoors oriented, don't necessarily shy away from it. Be up front and turn the weakness into a strong point. Think about recurring income. If it doesn't last forever, you've got to replace it. And if I tell you from day one that you're going to have to replace it after a certain period of time, your expectation is that I have to replace it after a certain period of time. So an example, I know one sublimator does um, like 100 license plates for a local police department. And he told them from day one, listen, you're going to get two years out of this. That's how long to get out of the car anyway. But he says you're going to get about two years out of this, and then you have to replace them because they're going to fade. They're like, okay. So every two years, they order another 100 license plates. Can't go wrong with that. That's recurring income. Um, so that's, that's an important aspect as you, you play with these things is think about if I'm going to do something for somebody that's outdoors, you want to be honest with them that it's not designed for that. Um, and typically, fading is the biggest problem. I mean, it depends on the substrate. I mean, certain substrates, you're not going to put out in the weather anyway. I mean, really. You can put some of these woods out in, in the weather. They're probably going to start to crack and you know, have problems. But some substrates will do fine outside, though the sublimation may still fade. For example, memorial products. Uh, there's a trend to use some of the stone or slate products and actually affix them to headstones. Well, they're going to fade over time. Um, another sublimator friend of mine pointed out that what she does is when she sells these memorial plaques, she tells the family, listen, you expect to get two years out of it, I'm going to sell you a package of three. So she gives, sells them a package of three so that they can change it out whenever they feel the need to. Okay, And so she turned a single-piece cell into a three-piece cell. So she worked it to her advantage. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, they make some different sprays and stuff for UV. Um, at Sawgrass, we haven't currently, we don't have anything like that that we recommend. We haven't really identified anything through testing that um, really prevents any type of breakdown from UV. In fact, some feedback that I've gotten from some of the dealers out there who have experimented was some of the, the UV coating products will actually uh, cause imaging problems with the sublimation. So that's one that's fire beware and you have to experiment on your own to see if you can find something. And really you've got to do some product testing. I mean if you want to find something that supposedly works with UV, because it's a gradual fading, you're going to have to go ahead and take two products and one you coat and one you don't and put it in the direct sunlight right now and check it back you know, in a year two years, three years, and see if it's really working. I got somebody who's doing that for me right now. And so far, I think he's two years into it. He hasn't seen any difference between the coated one and the uncoated one as far as UV resistance. So 
Anyway, eh, nothing wrong with experimenting, right? Okay. The other thing is, I've been hammered in, is it only works on flat surfaces. Why? Because, of course, the heat press is flat. That's why. Um, but, you know, we can go beyond. We're starting to see more rounded types of products, and there are some new ways to do that, uh, going beyond the heat press. One is, of course, the mug press. And the mug press is designed for mugs. Okay, but it's a cylindrical press. Keep that in mind, it's cylindrical. So <clears throat> within reason, other things like maybe water bottles might fit down in there. Now, it all has to do with the diameter because your mug press will only compress a certain amount of distance, so it doesn't work for every cylindrical item as far as diameter. And you have to carefully select the right mugs to fit your press and the bottles and everything else. But you definitely can experiment with, hey, here's a non-traditional item I can put in there. More likely, you can take a look at some of the wrap systems. Mug wraps were designed obviously for um, the purpose of mugs, but basically it's it's a wrap, it's a physical wrap that goes around the mug, and then it has a mechanical latch that you tighten down so that it puts pressure on the transfer, holding it against the mug, so you can put it in a convection oven. Now, <clears throat> this does take longer. See, so going back to settings, when you put mugs in a convection oven, it takes about 12 to 15 minutes for the sublimation process to occur instead of uh, one to five minutes, which you would have with a press. But you also can put multiple mugs in at the same time, and it doesn't extend the cooking time at all. So cooking time is the same whether it's one or a dozen in there. But the neat thing here is people are starting experimenting with wraps beyond mugs. Okay, what else can I wrap out there to make this thing work? You know, and as a result, the wrap manufacturers are coming out with different size wraps. So now, for example, you can find products. There are some coated pet food bowls out there that can be done and around it using these larger wraps. So that does take us past that flat type of thing. I think you're also going to see some of the 3D sublimation presses um, really coming of age pretty soon too. So that's on the horizon um, as well, which will give you the ability to do some odd shaped side things. But you can use you know, these wraps if you experiment. You know, you can use these wraps on some other things. Yes, you can You can do sublimation in a convection oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. You have to have something that holds the transfer tightly against the surface. That's why we're using a wrap. And whatever it is that's holding it can't catch on fire <laughs> or melt or any of that you know, while it's in the oven. But other than that, if you can find a way to hold it on there, it might work. Maybe some more experimentation on your part. And then finally, you've probably been told that it only works with sublimation-ready products, manufactured products. And, and there's a good reason you're being told that, okay? Because quality image really depends on a quality surface. And we are depending on items to either be natural polymers or polyester or more likely to have a polymer coating on there such that the sublimation will bond there to the coating itself. Now, you know, we have manufacturers doing this all day long. They've manufactured products specifically for this process. Their coatings are designed specifically for this. And you get that good quality coating, then you get a good quality image. But can you do it yourself? You know, that question comes up to me all the time. And the answer is, I hate to say yes, but it is sort of, okay? <laughs> Sounds scary, huh? Uh, the reality is probably maybe is a better answer. Um, there's more to this than just spraying some type of polymer coating onto something because if you don't get a good balanced surface, equal depth, equal coverage, you're going to get an unbalanced sublimation. Um, if you've ever spray painted anything, and I'm sure you have, uh, one of the first things you typically notice if there's a good contrast in color between the background and the spray is that you see these gaps and runs, and that means you don't have a great paint there, uh, paint um, job there. So see, if you think about those experiences and you apply them to this, if I had just a can of some kind of so-called polymer coating and I'm spraying it on, do I really get a good coating in place? Does it even bond properly to the item? If I took a wooden plaque and I wanted to sublimate it and I took my own you know, can of coating and went and sprayed it on there, could I get a good enough coating surface to actually do good quality sublimation? It's a big question. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into that, and manufacturers typically will put down like a, a primer and then it may be sanded and then they'll put you know, a base coat and then maybe a top coat too. So it's, it's very carefully controlled with computers. Uh, to make sure that they have consistent surfaces there, okay? Uh, you and a can of spray paint are probably not going to get that. So set your expectations accordingly. Uh, if you want to experiment with it, I do know people that have, you know, created some of their own product lines with their own coatings, but I'm telling you, there's nothing easy about it. It was a lot of work, a lot of experimentation, 
uh, a lot of trial and error to be able to get what they wanted. And even then, it wasn't necessarily a cheap process. And that's what you got to ask the question for. Are you doing this because you think you can save a few bucks? You won't save any money doing it yourself. Okay? That you won't do. Uh, you may get something unique that you haven't been able to find anywhere else if you're successful. You will not save money doing it. So uh, make sure if you even experiment, you're doing it for the right reasons. But hey, I'm all for experimentation. So keep that in mind. Maybe you can work through that. Okay? So that kind of brings us to the end here. Uh, and just a quick wrap up, if you're going to experiment, you're going to break some rules. That's cool. I mean, I'm all about breaking rules. Uh, just don't come back and yell at me when it didn't work because I told you, hey, it'd be fun to break a few rules. But in the experiment and document, do think, make changes in very small increments and make notes about it so that you can see. Because uh, especially with sublimation, you can see significant changes within a 5 to 10 degree spread of temperature depending on what it is that you're working with. So you need to make gradual changes to see what it does, document it. And it's a scientific process. Uh, you want to keep up with it. It's just like you know, creating a new food recipe. If you sit there at the stove and just throw a bunch of food into a pot and it comes out really good but you didn't keep up with it, you'll probably never be able to reproduce it again either. And then also test everything. Okay, if, if you're sublimating with your own coatings a new type of product, you want to do like the scratch test with your fingernail. You want to sublimate it, and then you want to take it and see if you can scratch it off with your fingernail. If you can, that means that the consumer can too, and it's probably not a good coating. Uh, if you do something on apparel, you want to wash it multiple times to make sure it doesn't wash off or do anything weird you know, in the laundry. So that's all part of this too, if you want to go beyond those boundaries. Okay, with that said, the, that's going to bring us down here to the end. So, uh, David, if you're still there and you want to hop back in, um, here's a perfect time now for any questions that you might have to go ahead and send the questions over and, and we'll do our best to answer them. So 